Beginning with this lecture, I want to begin going through uh, the book of Re Revelation section by section. So here we will be looking at chapter 1. Now in verse 1, 4, and in verse 9, the author identifies himself as John, most probably the Apostle John, and he says that he was writing from the island, island of Patmos, which is in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, now, as we've already mentioned in previous lectures, the book of Revelation is designed to apply to the entire church, uh, and we talked about that when, it, when John says in verse 4 he's writing to the seven churches that are, that are in Asia. We described in an earlier lecture reasons why uh, those seven churches are representative of the entire church throughout the world at all times in history. So what John is doing is basically giving us uh, a God's eye view of a great cosmic drama that begins began in the first century uh, and will continue up until Jesus comes again. And then at the end of the book of Revelation, he talks about the new heavens and the new earth. So it's the, the drama that's lasted now for over 2,000 years and will continue ultimately forever in the new heavens and the new earth. But in this great cosmic drama, uh, and here in chapter 1, uh, he focuses on God and Christ and then talks about our response. Uh, and so, for example... In uh, verse 4, he uh, says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and uh, who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. And in verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So he's talking about God. Um, God is the great author and director of this worldwide, universe-wide cosmic drama. He ultimately is in charge of all things. Um, and when he's talking about he is, was, and is to come, and he is the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty, these are all different ways of telling us that God is sovereign over all of history, past, present, and future. Now, Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, um, and that's telling us that nothing that exists is outside of God's control. He is eternal. He's the first and the last. And when he says that he's the Almighty, that's telling us that there is no power in heaven and on earth that is greater than his. Um, so, first thing we need to ask ourselves is, do we really believe that? Um, and that's why the book of Revelation is so important. Because if we just look to our own circumstances, uh, we can wonder, God, where are you? What are you doing? Um, well, that's why Revelation is important, because it's giving us an overview of showing how God, in fact, is orchestrating history. We may not understand why he's doing what he's doing, and we may not like what's going on, but Revelation is telling us he does have a plan, he knows the end from the beginning, and everything that is happening, both good and bad, are ultimately working to bring about to fruition his plan. Now, in verse 4, he talks about the seven spirits uh, who are before the throne. Now, the uh, seven spirits is probably a figurative reference to the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit clearly is one. Um, and yet, he is referred to as the seven spirits here in chapter 1, verse 4, and again in chapter 5, verse 6, or as the NIV translates it, the sevenfold spirit. Now, in Revelation 5, verse 6, the seven spirits are equated with uh, Christ's vision. Revelation 5, verse 6 says, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures, and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the seven spirits are equated with uh, the seven eyes of the lamb. 
In an earlier lecture, we talked about the use of numbers in Revelation, how seven is very typically a number of fulfillment or fullness or completion, indicating Christ has all um, vision. In other words, he's omniscient. Um, uh, the seven horns indicate power. He has all power. Um, now, the seven spirits, uh, again, we've talked in other lectures how what John does is either quote or allude to passages in the Old Testament, uh, and the seven spirits have probably been adapted from Zechariah chapter 3 and Zechariah chapter 4, because in Zechariah 3 verse 9, it talks about the seven eyes are related to an inscription that deals with God's removing iniquity from the land. And in Zechariah 4, it talks about the seven lamps and the seven eyes, which are associated with God's spirit. And so what John is doing here is interpreting the seven eyes in Zechariah as God's spirit and has identified uh, both the seven eyes and the spirit as a possession uh, of the Lamb. Now, so what we have here is the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit suggests the fullness of the spirit. So we've seen God being mentioned and the spirit being mentioned, and both are indicating both the references to God as the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, and the spirit as the sevenfold or seven spirits shows the fullness of God uh, and the spirit uh, their total sovereignty, their total control, and their total power. But as Revelation 1 verse 1 points out, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, and so, to a large extent, this book and the great cosmic drama that it speaks of is in the hands of Jesus Christ. Um, now, in verse 2, uh, it says that uh, the, this was com communicated by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, those two phrases are parallel. The word of God concerns what God has carried out through Jesus Christ. It is God in Christ who is the main character of the great cosmic drama. And verse 5 specifies the work of Christ when it says he is the faithful witness. And it goes on to say, uh, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings of the earth, uh, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. In other words, Jesus Christ lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died, and he paid the penalty for our sin that otherwise we would have to pay, but never could. And the Father accepted his sacrifice, and that is proven when Christ raised from the dead. That's why in verse 5 it says he is the firstborn from the dead. Um, and the fact that the Father accepted Christ's sacrifice is also shown by Christ's ascension back to the throne of God, where, as verse 5 says, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. But uh, verse 7 tells us that his work is not completed. Christ's work is not completed because it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Now, when it says that he is coming with the clouds, that uh, is quoting from Daniel, uh, or, yeah, he's coming with the clouds, that's quoting from Daniel 7, verse 13. We've said earlier that uh, Revelation draws a lot on the book of Daniel. Um, and so it says that Jesus is coming. And yet uh, in verse 8, it talks about uh, the Lord God is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. In other words, Jesus is equated with God. He is the Son of God, the divine Son of God. He is the second person of the triune God, consisting of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, so, the uh, uh, what we see 
here. Uh, so far, at, this is just the very beginning of the book, we see God, and particularly Christ, front and center uh, of, uh, of Revelation and of the great cosmic drama. Now, chapter 1 goes on to give us further details of what Christ is like. And so we need to take a look at that, and that is found in the second half of chapter 1. But it's important to note uh, that the uh, in verse 10, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Now, we've said before uh, that uh, the book of Revelation is based all on symbols. Uh, and John indicates that when he says he's in the Spirit, in other words, He's having a vision. He heard something like, uh, and, and so he says, I heard, uh, verse 10, I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. That is very typical visionary or auditory uh, language. Uh, when he says, I saw something like this. In verse 14, he says, speaking about Jesus, his head and his hair, uh, well, let me just read that. He says, Verse 14, his head uh, and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like uh, uh, a flame of fire. Verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze, which has been made to glow in the furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters. That is typical visionary language. So when we read Revelation, remember, this is symbol. Don't think that, oh, when Jesus was on earth, he had black hair because he was a Middle Eastern Jew. No, but now he has white hair. And he doesn't have brown eyes, but he has funny-shaped eyes that are yellow or orange, and they look like flames of fire. No, remember, this is not a literal description. This is symbolic description of Jesus in his glory now to bring out different aspects of who this person, Jesus, really is. Um, they are uh, symbolic portrayals to show the essence of what and who Jesus really is. Now, this language in verses 14 and 15 that I just read is taken from the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 uh, and uh, Daniel chapter 10. So let me read Daniel 7 verse 9. Uh, he says, Daniel was having a vision. He said, I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was white like snow, or was like white snow. And the hair of his head was pure wool, like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were a burning fire. Then verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Then in Daniel 10, verses 5 and 6, it says, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of uphaz. His body was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms were like feet, uh, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. So what John is doing in Revelation 1 in describing Jesus, he's drawing from Daniel uh, to show uh, the essence of Jesus. But note something. In Daniel 7, it said that the Ancient of Days, which would be God, or God the Father, had vesture was white like snow and hair was the hair of his head was like pure wool. Here in Revelation, these same images are being applied to Jesus Christ. So Jesus is both um, distinguished from and yet identified with the Ancient of Days. This gets us back to the mysterious notion of the Trinity. There is only one God, but he is a God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And by the way, in our Ecclea book on uh, Christianity and Islam, I have a lengthy section explaining the Trinity. Um, and so I would suggest, because many people, including many church leaders, have trouble with the Trinity, and yet the Trinity is 
incredibly biblical, is found throughout the Bible, and it's also hints of it are found throughout nature. So I highly suggest that you read that section on the Trinity in our book on Christianity and Islam. But the uh, identifying Christ and the ancient of days here in Revelation 1 is suggesting that, that there is a plurality to the Godhead. Jesus is not lesser and the Father is not greater. They are equal in essence. Uh, and that's why the same descriptions are used for both of them. Now, um, in uh, verse 14, it talks about eyes like flames of fire. Uh, I believe we, we talked about that in an earlier lecture. That is suggesting uh, not only the fact that Jesus, with eyes like flames of fire, his seeing is not just external. He can see, and it burns down to the heart. That's why uh, uh, I believe it's in for Samuel, uh, God says, or it says that man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. He sees to the heart. So Jesus's eyes burn all the way down to our heart. Nothing is hidden from him. Furthermore, fire is very typically in the Bible a symbol for judgment. First Corinthians three says that the nature of our works will be revealed by fire. Uh, and Jesus having eyes like flames of fire occurs again throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, for example, in Revelation 19, uh, when it, the flames of fire of the eyes are specifically used in the context uh, of when Jesus returns to earth to judge and to wage war. Um, and so that uh, th this whole idea that nothing's hidden from him, everything will come into judgment, is revealed in Revelation 2, where he says that all the churches will know that I am the one who searches the hearts and minds. In verse 15, we talked about his feet like burnished bronze made to glow in a furnace. As we saw earlier, that imagery is from Daniel 10, verse 6. And it reinforces the picture of Jesus as judge because eyes like flames of fire and feet like burnished bronze appear together again in Revelation 2, verse 18. Now, on that occasion, they are immediately followed by the words, Jesus' words, I know your deeds. And then he goes on to promise the church judgment or reward based on whether there is repentance or not. So Jesus is the judge. But Jesus is a judge unlike any other kind of judge. He is the judge who has himself been judged. Remember, on the cross, he stepped into our shoes. He bore our punishment. And one's feet suggests one's walk, in other words, one's life. Jesus himself walked this earth as a man. Um, and when verse 15 says his feet were like burnished bronze uh, made to glow in the fire, bronze, again, is a typical biblical symbol suggesting judgment. Um, and so, uh, Verse 15 concludes by saying that his voice is the sound of many waters. Again, this image suggests that Jesus is God himself. Because in Ezekiel 43, it says, it, uh, Ezekiel says, The glory of the God of Israel, his voice was like the sound of many waters. Now, uh, it goes on uh, in verse 16 to talk about the seven stars. Uh, and it says that uh, out of his mouth, Jesus' mouth, uh, came a sharp two-edged sword. This image again reflects the picture of Jesus as judge and the sword out, out of the mouth is found again in Revelation 2 and Revelation 19. Both contexts are Jesus judging. His face, like the uh, sun shining in its strength, takes us back to the transfiguration, which was a prefigure of Jesus in all his glory because Matthew tells us that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus' face shone like the sun, his garments became uh, white as light. And in verse 17, it's, Jesus calls himself, uh, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. That, again, is a description of God Almighty in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 41, 44, and 48, God describes himself as the first and the last. So, again, this indicates the 
identity of Jesus with God and shows that he is sovereign over all of history. Um, and we saw earlier that the Lord Almighty said that I am the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Well, in verse 18, Jesus reinforces this. He says, I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. In other words, in his own death uh, and resurrection, he defeated death himself. No one else has ever done that, because no one else was fully man and fully God at the same time. So now we need to ask ourselves, what does all of this mean for us? Because in Revelation, in chapter 1, verse 3, a blessing is promised. It says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things that are written in it. Um, and so we are expected here to read and heed what is being said in this book. And heed means keep this, be faithful. We are to be faithful just as Jesus himself is faithful. Now, there are a couple of other aspects of this that I just want to mention before we conclude this lecture. In verse 9, John says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and the kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. Now, so he's talking about the tribulation and the kingdom. I think we've talked about this also in earlier lectures, but as to the kingdom, there is what is known as the already and the not yet of the kingdom. Jesus, when he came the first time, inaugurated the kingdom. Jesus said, when I cast out demons, the kingdom has come uh, among you. And when two or three are gathered in my name, there am I, your king, in their midst. So the kingdom is now, but the kingdom has not yet been consummated. That is why we have tribulation, suffering, evil, sin, and death now, even though the kingdom has been uh, inaugurated. One day, when he comes again, the kingdom will be consummated. Uh, and, and at that time, all suffering, evil, sin, and death will be eliminated. But there is also an already but not yet aspect to the tribulation. John said, I am your fellow partaker in the tribulation. So the tribulation had already begun in John's day, and that was 2,000 years ago. Um, and he says that he's, in, in verse 19, he says that uh, I am, well, let me, before I get there, when he says, I'm your fellow partaker, that means since John was experiencing tribulation, so far as we know, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. But he says, I'm your fellow partaker. That means if he partook in tribulation, we can expect to partake in tribulation as well. Jesus himself said in Luke 16, in this world, you have tribulation. So tribulation will take place throughout all of history. Um, but, uh, so that's the already of the tribulation. And yet, uh, Revelation suggests uh, that the church, the tribulation against the church probably will increase shortly before Christ's return. That is the not yet of the tribulation. In verse 19, where John is told to write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. In other words, he is writing about past, present, and future. What Jesus is showing us in this book uh, applies throughout the earth, throughout all time, and that includes tribulation. And that is why, in verse 9, the word perseverance is so important. He said, I am your fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus. Jesus persevered all the way to the end. And as we will see uh, in chapters 2 and 3, that is what he calls us to do too. We are to be like him. Uh, we are to be conformed to his image, according to Romans 8, verse 29. We are to be overcomers, which means we are faithful all the way to the end. Um, and so, uh, let me just conclude this 
by quoting briefly here from Revelation 1, verse 20, where John concludes chapter 1 by saying, As to the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my hand, well, actually, this is Jesus speaking, As to the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, we've said before that the seven churches are representative of all churches throughout history in all places on the earth. Um, but uh, I think one of the authors uh, that I particularly like concerning Revelation uh, is Greg Beale. Uh, he's now, I believe, at Westminster Seminary. Uh, but Beale says this regarding verse 20, and I think this is a good way that we can end this lecture. He says, Addressing the churches through their representative angels is to remind the churches that already a dimension of their existence is heavenly, that their real home is not with the unbelieving earth dwellers, and that they have heavenly help and protection in their struggle not to be conformed to their pagan environment. And one of the purposes of the church meeting in its weekly gatherings is to be reminded of its heavenly existence and identity. We need to remember that. John is stressing that in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation applies to our churches. And again, so many of us forget the heavenly dimension of the church and of our very existence. Again, Ephesians 2 uh, verse 6 says that Christ has raised us and seated us with him in heavenly places. That is present tense. We saw in an earlier lecture in uh, Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, it looked at the church being seated on the thrones, uh, and so ruling with, with Christ. Um, and so we need to remember, particularly when things go bad, that we are not alone, and we are not living and acting in our own strength alone. Rather, the sovereign God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are with us and are acting through us to bring about the consummation of God's plan and that there is a heavenly dimension to the church. The church is surrounded with angels. We may not see them. We may not hear them. We may not feel them. But this is the living reality of the church. The church is far more important and far more integral to God's plan than most of us spend our days realizing. So think about these things. Realize that. And remember when we gather together as a body on Sundays or during the week, we are in the presence of the angels. We are a heavenly gathering of people here on earth. Because even though we are of the world, or we are in the world, we're not of the world. Our true citizenship is in heaven. In the next lecture, we'll go on to chapters 2 and 3 to talk about Jesus' seven messages to the seven churches.